It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Larry Lesseur and Harlan Cleveland, executive editor of The Reporter magazine. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Dr. V.K. Wellington Koo, nationalist China's ambassador to the United States. Representing a foreign country in Washington is always difficult, but when your country is embroiled in a hot civil war, it doesn't make it any easier. But Nationalist China is represented by one of the world's most experienced diplomats. Dr. Wellington Ku has been his country's foreign minister six times. Dr. Ku, you've served your country for three decades now, and now you represent them in Washington. Tell me, do you think that the two Chinas can ever exist in peace? I don't think so. Unless uh, you mean uh, uh, peace uh, excludes, say, a rebelling on the uh, mainland, which will upset the regime in Peiping. Well, do you think that the situation between the two Chinas, Dr. Ku, could ever be settled without recourse to all-out war? Uh, well, if you mean uh, all-out war, uh, uh, a general conflict, I said uh, uh, no. It can be settled without a third world war. Well, Dr. Ku, uh, I think most people in this country and <coughs> most of our allies seem to feel at this moment that the thing to do is to have a ceasefire in the Formosa Strait. Uh, does your government share that view? Well, uh, we certainly have not been taking the initiative to stir up hostilities. It's the communists who have been uh, bomb bombing us and bombarding us. And so really the question rests with the communists. If they stop fighting, if they stop attacking, there'll be no hostilities. Well, suppose, for example, uh, the communists were to agree to some form of Geneva conference, or whatever you call it, peacemaking conference. Um, would this be a conference that the uh, uh, government of nationalist China could enter and could uh, negotiate with them in? You know, uh, we think that the Chinese communists they are the uh, 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 tools and the puppets of international communism uh, directed uh, uh, at, uh, at Moscow. Therefore, we don't think they are qualified really to uh, uh, sit in a conference and uh, undertake any commitments. Well, uh, Dr. Ku, do you think that a ceasefire in the Formosan Straits would constitute a step towards uh, international recognition of communist China by the United Nations and possibly later by the United States? I suppose that is what is in the mind of those who are trying to promote a ceasefire, particularly uh, the, uh, some of the Western European countries and also some countries in Asia. Well. Uh, do you feel that the communists are driving at a conference which would ex <coughs> pardon me, exclude nationalist China? In other words, the communists have turned down any conference under UN auspices. They say the United Nations is unacceptable, and they've also refused to sit down in a conference outside the United Nations in which your country, nationalist China, is represented. But just what are they driving at then? I think uh, you are on the right track, Mr. Lesser. They certainly want, they do not recognize the United Nations authority and they certainly do not uh, recognize us. They want to play the full part as uh, uh, representing China uh, internationally. That's what they are driving after, I think. Well, do you think they mean negotiating or do you think they want war? Well, uh, uh, it depends. If they could get their, get what they are after by negotiation, they will negotiate. On the other hand, if things come to a point where they have to resort to force to some extent, they will try to use force. But I doubt very much that they are ready or they, are, they, are, they want a general uh, uh, war because they are not prepared yet. This alternation between um, 
negotiation of war seems to be the communist trick all over the world. I wonder, Dr. Ku, you were foreign minister back in some of the early days of the relationship between the uh, Russians, the new Soviet Union at that time, the early 20s, and uh, the Chinese nationalist government. Do you see a basis for a permanent uh, mutuality of interest, a permanent alliance between the Soviet Union and uh, the Chinese on the mainland? Or do you think that there are seeds of disunion between them? Well, if you mean uh, the Chinese, between the Chinese people and Soviet Russia, I say there is no chance at all. Because the Russian policy has always been well understood. It's one of imperialism, of uh, uh, aggression, aggrandizement. But if you mean that uh, uh, cooperation between Moscow and Peiping, as it is now, that is uh, between the Russian branch of the international communists and the Chinese communists, I think there's a very good chance they'll continue to work on together. Well, Dr. Ku, when you were foreign minister of China, before the communists were strong on the mainland, what were the sources, were there any sources of friction between your country and Russia? Plenty. What, er what areas did they come about in? In uh, uh, Xinjiang, uh, it's no, which is known as Chinese Turkestan, uh, Mongo Outer Mongolia, Northern Manchuria. We, uh, through the uh, past uh, hundred years, and even more than that, we had plenty of troubles with the Russians. And you think that the seeds of potential trouble still lie up there in the north on the, on the borderlands of, of China and Soviet Russia? Undoubtedly, there are questions which are still uh, uh, outstanding. Uh, but uh, the Russians and the uh, Chinese communists, they are playing together just now. And uh, the communists do not uh, take nationalism very seriously because they all believe in international communism. So those questions lie in abeyance. I wonder if we could come back, Dr. Gu, for a minute to the uh, Formosa Strait. One of the questions that's been most discussed and is uh, most confused, I think, in most of our minds is who really owns Formosa anyway? The communists claim it, your government <coughs> claims it, and there are some who think that it ought to be a UN trusteeship or whatnot. Uh, well, what's the story on who owns Formosa? Well, Mr. Cleveland, uh, uh, if you uh, speak of ownership in the ordinary sense of the word, I think there's no question that the Republic of China owns Formosa today. You don't mean the People's Republic either, do you? Not at all, uh, certainly <laughs> not. <laughs> As I, I might add, you know, uh, the uh, uh, Charter of the United Nations mentions uh, the Republic of China as one of the permanent members. The Cairo Conference uh, allocated Formosa to the Republic of China. And the agreement of the three powers at Cairo was confirmed at Potsdam which was in turn again uh, 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 affirmed uh, by the instrument of surrender by, uh, by Japan. Well, Dr. Ku, do you think it would be possible <coughs> if the Chinese communists cannot be ousted from the mainland, and they seem to be pretty well fixed there, that a political formula could be written for Formosa in which we made into a republic of Formosa? Would that be satisfactory? to the people on Formosa now? No, it will not be, because we feel that uh, uh, the Chinese mainland, the jury, belongs to the Re Republic of China. And we still have a deep faith. Someday, we will go back to the mainland. If necessary, we will fight back to the mainland. Well, what effect would a ceasefire in the Formosa Straits have on the morale of the people on Formosa? That would it would apparently foreclose any ambitions that you had to go back to the mainland, would it not? I think it will have that effect to a great extent. And I think that those who are urging a ceasefire uh, may think of uh, uh, so-called uh, stabilizing situation, but it wouldn't solve any question fundamentally. So you wouldn't count a ceasefire as among the objectives of your government at this time in, in, in the Formosa Strait? No, no, I don't think we would accept it because, after all, it's a question really not of a, a, a war going on. It's a question of one party pursuing a policy of aggression. In this case, it is the Chinese Communists. 
have been taking the initiative in attacking the territories occupied, possessed, uh, owned by the by nationalist China. Well, Dr. Ku, do you think that the Chinese Communists will ever be satisfied without Formosa? Well, uh, that is difficult to say. I think they, so far, every official statement on the subject has been of such character that makes it very clear that they would not uh, rest until they do uh, have Formosa. Of course, they also said during the Korean War that they meant to drive the United Nations off the off the Korean Peninsula, and they didn't succeed, and they did sign a, a treaty anyway. But uh, what would strategic possession of Formosa mean to the communists, Dr. Ku? Oh, there they are. <coughs> For one thing, if they, if they could take Formosa, they would uh, uh, remove a thorn in their side, and they would think they'd remove a great danger to their uh, stability and consolidation on the mainland. And from another point of view, Formosa is such an important link in the chain of defense of the Western Pacific that uh, they would like to have it in order to, to, uh, in order to make a breach in this uh, chain of defense. Uh, it, uh, it will open to uh, the uh, uh, Pacific Ocean. And as you know, as well as I do, once Formosa in the hands of the communists, it would not be used by the Chinese communists alone. Soviet Russia will step in also. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Ku. It's always a pleasure to hear your words. The opinions expressed on the Longines Chronoscope were those of the speakers. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Larry Lesseur and Harlan Cleveland. Our distinguished guest was Dr. V.K. Wellington Ku, Nationalist China's ambassador to the United States. If ever you buy an automatic, that is, a self-winding watch, please bear in mind that an automatic is even more complicated than a hand-wound watch. And for that reason, it will pay you to make sure that the automatic watch you buy bears the name Longines. For Longines makes the world's most advanced automatic watches. Now, here are the facts. This diagram represents the winding rotor of an ordinary automatic. See how it moves only in half a circle. This diagram represents the Longines automatic. Now every Longines automatic watch contains the 360 degree full swing automatic winding rotor, a development pioneered by Longines engineers. Full swing motion means highest winding efficiency without winding shock. Now for the Longines motor moves freely in a full circle in every direction and every movement provides winding action. Now second you should know that in order to keep a watch thin some makers use a small movement and allow the rotors to swing outside in this fashion. In the Longines automatic the movement is full sized yet the entire watch is thin and that's a real achievement exclusively Longines and protected by patents. More important, however, is the micro precision of Longines manufacture and the precious hand finishing given to essential parts. This is the basic reason for the unparalleled accuracy of all Longines watches, including Longines automatics. Longines watches for ladies and gentlemen are made in a variety of styles, in stainless steel, gold filled, and in 14 karat gold cases. So if you pay $71.50 or more for a watch, for your own protection, insist on a Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. <laughs>